Continuing from where we left off last day, Nick. 124 kilogram. Sean, pick up here and then get the rest of this stuff later. Don't fall behind trying to get caught up. It'll work better. 124 kilogram mass is being pushed along the floor and the floor has a coefficient of friction of 0.25. The person pushing applies a force of 725 newtons over a distance of 22 meters. Yeah, whatever I said. Did I say 725? Okay. You know what, Nick? I think this is a job, a place for a good free body diagram. There's our box. I think we have room at the top there. What are the forces acting on this mask at the obvious ones? Darn right. Friction. <coughs> okay. Now A says, how much work is being done by the person pushing? Well, work equals force times distance. Which of those forces is the person pushing? Which of those four forces is the one that would be the person? I think the work done by the person pushing is going to be F applied times D. Do I know F applied? Oh, yeah. 700, oh, 525. Do I know the distance? Yep. 22. How many joules of work is this person doing? <laughs> Sorry, say it again. 11,550 joules of work. Is that right? Yeah. Except, race. not all of that is going into pushing this object. Some of this is going into overcoming friction. How much work is done by friction? Well, I think again, work is going to be force times distance. Which force do you think here? Friction. Okay. Uh, do I know friction? Okay. Friction is, is what? Doug, let's try that. I don't know the normal force. Oh, but look, 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 look. I know another force the same size as a normal force in my free body diagram. Which force has to be the same size as the normal force? So, looks like the force done by friction, the work done by friction here is going to be mu times the normal force, mg in this case, times the distance. Greg, I think it's going to be mu 0.25, mass 124, g 9.8, distance 22. <coughs> what do you get? Six, six, eight, four. Let's go six, six, eight, zero joules. We'll go to three sig figs, Abe. <clears throat> ah, Cole, Cole, thank you. I was about to open my mouth and ask, why am I wrong? And then I was going to pause and see if anybody could ponder it. But you saw where I was going ahead of time. You've had an epiphany. Do you know what an epiphany is? Epiph an epiphany is a sudden realization of a future understanding. One of the classic epiphanies, Star Wars, when Luke Skywalker realizes Darth Vader is his father. And suddenly that explains a whole bunch of things. You've had a little epiphany. When you have an epiphany in my class, you get a candy. Did 
hear what Cole said? Did you hear? He said, hey, Mr. Duick, wait a minute. You said that the force has to be in the same direction as the distance for it to be work. Uh, it is in the same level, the same plane, except it's in the opposite direction. How could I show, perhaps, that it's in the opposite direction? Huh? What this really means, Amanda, is you lost that much energy to friction. You poured in that much work, that much energy. That's how much went into heating up the floor, really, friction. Whatever's left went into moving the box. Oh, oh see, what's the net work done on the object? Work net is going to be work done by the applied. Now, TJ, if you called the friction positive, then it's the work done by the applied minus the work done by friction. If you called it negative, don't go minus, minus. What we're saying is you did uh, 11,000 joules, you lost 6,680, and we symbolized, Matt, the loss by putting a negative up there. Don't do a double negative in here because you get a minus, minus Jordan, which is a plus. It's going to be what was it, 11,550 minus 6,680. That's the network done. Eleven thousand five hundred and fifty minus six thousand six hundred and eighty. You know what? That's how much work we did on the actual mass. There is another way you could have found this if I just asked you part C and I didn't say do part A and part B. You could have found the net force, Roy, by going winner minus loser equals MA, where MA is F net. You could have found <coughs> F net and just multiplied that by the distance and that would get you the same place. Okay. Homework. I gave you those questions to try. We're going to do a part two of, or well, the next lesson, part one, it's going to be about a 20-minute lesson. And then we're going to uh, give you the rest of the class to work. And I'll take questions from the homework during class or next class. So normally I would pause right now, but I want to get to the next part of the lesson. I didn't quite finish with you guys yesterday. So lesson two, which I'm going to break into two parts. The title is The Law of Conservation of Energy. If you ask me to list three or four of the most important laws of the universe. This might be one of them. This is my fallback. Did I miss somebody? No? OK. Uh, this is my fallback. Uh, if someone has a question about physics or about uh, is something possible, superhero physics, comic book physics, whatever, I almost always fall back to here. And this is how I can prove or disprove that something is possible. <clears throat> Part one. First of all, in general, as Cole so eloquently pointed out, a force in the direction of the motion, like F1 below, does positive work. A force opposite to motion, like F2 below, does negative work. Although force can be positive or negative, it's not a vector, it's a scalar. The negative means something else. What does negative work mean, patients? We need to give you another definition, energy. Energy is the ability to do work. The ability to exert a force over a distance. There are many types of energy. There is the energy of motion. This is called kinetic energy. Anything that's moving has kinetic energy. If I were to throw this tennis ball at Enzo's face, could it do work? Could it apply a force over a distance when it hit him? And yes, in fact, if it was really, really heavy, it could dent his skull and actually apply a, a bigger for, a force over a bigger distance. Too big a distance, like that much, if it really dents his skull, would be fatal. Too much energy would kill a person. Okay? By the way, any weapon is basically an energy transfer device. <clears throat> any weapon is an energy transfer device. Enzo, stand up right here. The very first weapon from the dawn of the cavemen was this. Your fists. What you're doing when you strike somebody is you're transferring the energy of motion 
to someone's body and you're hoping to give them more than they can comfortably absorb. You're wanting to apply a force over a distance more than they can comfortably absorb. Then they moved up. The next weapon was a club or maybe a rock in someone's hand. But again, what you're doing is you're increasing the mass. You're still trying to transfer kinetic energy. Uh, then they went mobile, a spear or a bow. Again, what we're doing is we're sending an object that has kinetic energy, and we want to try and see if someone's pr uh, body or target can absorb that much kinetic energy safely. And if they can't, they've got a problem. In fact, really, all an artillery shell is, Nick, is that on a much larger scale. It's a whole bunch of kinetic energy being transferred from one point to another. You may start to think about what kinetic energy is calculated by. We'll get to that in a second. Uh, the next step is actually dispensing with the objects of mass and actually transferring some type of heat energy, laser beams or whatever. But it's all about transferring energy from one object to another. That's what a weapon is. Uh, transferring so much energy, Roy, that the target can't absorb it without the force times, without something bad happening. So energy of motion, anything that moves has kinetic energy. Uh, let's suppose that this tennis ball was faster. I threw it harder. Do you think it has more energy or less energy? More. So one of the things you're going to find in the equation for kinetic energy is a V for speed. Uh, what if instead of a tennis ball, it was a bowling ball? Do you think that would do more damage or less damage? More. Do you think it has more energy or less energy? So there's going to be an M in the equation as well. Kinetic energy depends on how fast and how heavy. We'll get there in a bit. Uh, another type of energy is heat, created by friction. Heat, Nick, is very tough mathematically. The physics of heat, TJ, usually to do it properly, you really need calculus because the heat changes. For example, if you have an object that you heat up, generally it's cooler in the middle and hotter as you go out to the edges. Well, that's really tough to deal with mathematically because now uh, you've got a changing uh, you need calculus. Gravitational potential energy. This is... The energy, the stored energy, because it's potential. An object possesses due to its position. The energy that an object possesses due to its position. Here's an object. If I were to let this go and it hit Enzo's head, would it exert a force over a distance? Could it do work? So does it have energy? More energy or less energy? More energy or less energy? How much energy? Okay, so you know what, I think the equation for potential energy will at least partly depend on the height. Instead of this, bowling ball. More energy than this, or less energy than this? It's also going to, uh, the mass is going to be in that equation. What do I do, Mr. Duick? You just were, Enzo. Uh, Chemical potential energy. Now, the word potential is a fancy word for stored energy. So one way to store energy, Jamie, is to lift something up and hold it there. Gravitational potential. Uh, chemicals store energy all the time. The food that you eat, gunpowder, explosives. There's all sorts of different types of energy. You want some other types? Hey, there's uh, sound energy. Sound is a form of energy. Elastic energy, when you pull a bungee cord or a rubber band, you're storing energy as potential, and then you can get it back. Usually as kinetic is the easiest transformation to go with. Uh, nuclear energy, that's the energy that's stored in the nucleus of atoms, and when you split them, it gives off some energy. In this course, we're going to look at two main types. We describe them as... mechanical energy. And the two main types are 
Kinetic, and I'll abbreviate that as capital K, capital E for kinetic energy. And <coughs> gravitational potential, and I'll just abbreviate that as PE for potential energy. And Cole, this allows us now to explain negative work. When you do negative work on an object, what you're really saying is that the object is losing energy. It's losing energy. Ready? Force times distance. I just did work on it. You see it? I have stored potential energy in here. It's going to now lose some energy. It's going to transfer some of its energy to kinetic energy. OK, ready? Enzo, incoming. Right there. Negative work by the gun, on the gun. Positive work on the dart. How much? Well, we'll get to that. By the way, that's really why I bought the Nerf dart gun. It's a great example of stored potential and energy transformation. So, gravitational potential energy. This is our first equation. It's on your formula sheet, but you'll probably end up memorizing this one, Greg, because you're tired of looking it up. And you actually already know this one. This is the work that you must do against gravity in order to change an object's height. Well, we already said that uh, work is force times distance. <coughs> potential energy, when you raise something up, which force are you doing work against? And do you remember last day I said it's traditional when we're talking about a vertical distance to call it a height. Gravitational potential energy is MGH. Ooh, I, I should be careful. Kelly, it's MGH as long as we're near the Earth, and we will be for the rest of this year. But you may remember last unit we did do two equations for gravity. We did MG. But then we said, if you want to go far away from the Earth, there's also big G, big M, little m over R squared. That works universally. It's why we called it universal gravitation. There is a universal potential energy. It's big, it's scary, it's ugly. Physics 12, we will go cosmic. But for now, this year, MGH, as long as you're anywhere within a few hundred miles of the Earth, G is 9.8, good enough. But if you go further and further away, Enzo, G is no longer going to be 9.8. It's going to get weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker, right? Okay. As an example, Turn the page. Is it turn the page? Yes? Well, let me turn the page. Spencer has a mass of 75.4 kilograms. What's his weight? Ooh, this is a nice review of what we did last unit. <coughs> is weight measured in kilograms? Everybody say no. What is weight measured in? Ah, in fact, weight really means that. So it's, his weight is going to be 75.4 times 9.8. What's his weight in Newtons? 100, can't be 138, because that's, oh, so, oh, sorry, I was going, 738.9? So like you're really saying 739? I tend not to go more than three sig figs, because being that accurate after that with the equipment and data that we have is kind of silly. I mean, I was only accurate to three sig figs in his mass. I don't think it'd be, it wouldn't be accurate to try and be more accurate in his weight. So when Spencer jumps, this is uh, Spencer Evans from about four years ago when he graduated and this, we measured his vertical. He can raise his center of mass about 75 centimeters from the ground. At the top of his jump, how much potential energy does he possess? Well, okay. Potential energy is MGH, our new equation, where M was 75.4, G was 9.8, and TJ putting those two together, that's weight. Some teachers teach the potential energy equation as weight times height. I like the MGH because usually you have the mass. Uh, height, don't say 75, careful. Uh, 0.75. At 
at the top before he came back down, how much stored energy did he have? Like that? I don't know how you got it 553 out of there. I think it's 554 or not. Anyways. For me? No. If there's a one, you leave it. Or you round up, but you never round down. <coughs> yeah, I totally care. Um, jumping is a terrific energy transformation. When you lift something up, right now it has its maximum potential energy. At the very top, how fast are you going for a split second? So what's your kinetic energy for a split second? Then what happens is you start to fall. And what you'll learn next class is the law of conservation of energy says this potential energy can't vanish. It's got to go somewhere. It goes into kinetic, the energy of motion. You speed up, you speed up, you speed up. Just as you hit the ground, what's your potential energy when you hit the ground? Zero. All of it has become kinetic. That's why you're at your fastest just at impact. It's another way to think about free fall in terms of energy, not in terms of forces of gravity. Oh, uh, by the way, energy has to come from somewhere. When you jumped, when Spencer jumped, where did that energy come from? Not from the floor. Where did that come from? Not from the floor. No. Where did that come from? His muscles? Yes. Where did that come from? No, it's not a force. You guys are way overthinking it. Came from came from his food. You guys are all energy transformation devices. You're losing energy every day. That energy has to come from somewhere. You get it from your food. That's why if you don't eat right, you feel fatigued. We even say it, I have no energy. Now, you don't quite mean it that way, but it's actually literally true. If you don't get enough food, you won't have enough energy for your bodily functions to work properly. <clears throat> Some potential energy in food is really easy to get at. We call that sugar. Gives you a quick energy burst, but then gone. Uh, some stored energy lasts longer. Easy to go. Better to get at. Right? So that is uh, potential energy, gravitational potential energy, MGH. There's also kinetic energy. I'm just going to give you the equation. It's a bit yucky to derive. Kinetic energy is the energy of motion. And as an equation, it's this, a half mv squared. And you already, Joel, know what everything in here stands for. What do you think the M stands for? Take a guess. Mass. What do you think the V stands for? Take a guess. Now, I heard someone say velocity. I heard speed here. Why speed and not velocity? Because work is a scalar. And since work is joules and energy is the ability to do work, what do you think? Energy, scalar, or vector? Scalar. So you know what we put into the equation? Scalar values. Now, if you put in the velocity, you just leave off the direction. It's not, oh, and even if you put a negative in, what would happen to the negative when you squared it? So it's kind of, I'll say, idiot-proof somewhat. But for what it's worth, you're technically putting in a speed. I'll often say velocity and then catch myself, and I'll say speed. I know in physics 12, I teach my kids, if it's a complicated question, at the end of the year, once you finish the course, and you don't know what approach to take, I say, well, look, if they say speed, use a scalar approach like energy. If they say velocity, use a kinematics approach like D equals VIT plus a half AT squared and VF equals VI plus, try those. It's a little hint. Especially back when there used to be a provincial exam and they did have a big exam on everything. I tried to give them every trick I could at the trade. So, I looked this up online. I think it's accurate, but how accurate is stuff online? I don't know. I'm always a, a bit cynical with what I found. But according to the internet, a 357 Magnum bullet weighs 8.1 grams. It travels at 490 meters per second. 
How much kinetic energy does it possess? Uh, I heard Nick, by the way, say, that's a slow bullet. No. What's the speed of sound in meters per second? 333. It's actually 340, but 333 is a nice easy number for me to remember, and it depends on temperature and how high you are and how much moisture there is in the air, so it's actually not... It's about 330, 340-ish, but anyways, this is going faster than sound, the supersonic bullet. This is going five football fields in one second. You wouldn't be seeing this move. It's slower. It's a pistol. You can't. You, 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 rifles are always way more higher velocity. You got a longer distance over which to accelerate the bullet in the barrel. Short bu barrel, you only got that much room to accelerate the bullet. That much distance to accelerate the bullet. Oh, and since work is force times distance, and you only have a short distance, there's only so much work, so much energy you can do on the bullet. Oh, is that why rifle barrels longer, fast? Yeah. Uh, point five. What's the mass? Careful. It's not 8.1. Ah, now you got to be careful as well because there's a thousand grams in a kilogram. So a lot of people will go like this. Nope. You need two zeros and then an 8.1 times 490 squared. What's the fatal amount of energy to try to absorb in a small area on your body all at once? That much. Crunch the numbers. What do you get? Newtons? Not 972? Yeah. Energy is joules. <clears throat> if your body tries to absorb that in a very, very small area, it won't be able to. Okay. Wait a minute, Mr. Duick. I've, I've read of people getting shot wearing bulletproof vests and they survived. Clearly there's some way that you can absorb that much energy. We'll come back to that. But yeah, it has to do with lengthening the impact and spreading out the impact and the fact that energy is a scalar. By the way, go back to this equation here. Kinetic energy is a half mv squared. If you double the mass what happens to the amount of kinetic energy? Multiplies by 2. If you double the velocity, what happens to the amount of kinetic energy? Sean, what? Y4. If you can triple the velocity, how much more kinetic energy do you have? Okay. Who plays uh, hockey or tennis or golf here? Okay. Over the past 15 years, golf clubs, hockey sticks, and tennis rackets have become lighter because then you can swing them faster and there's way more bang for your buck by increasing the velocity. Yes, you lose, it's a bit of a trade-off, TJ, you lose a little bit of mass, which also does, like if you hit something with a bowling ball, that'll certainly do more kinetic energy transfer than hit, hitting something with a feather. Ah, but if you can get twice the mass, twice the velocity instead of twice the mass, you get way more bang for your buck. This is why all the sports equipment over the past 15 years is becoming lighter. Right? I have a tennis racket from 15 years ago. I can hardly use it anymore. It feels like a clunker. Hockey sticks, they're all composite. Yes? No longer wood. And it's all about realizing there's way more bang for your buck, Joel. The more I can increase that, even if it's a, and the more I can increase my velocity, my speed, even if I'm trading off by lowering the mass a bit, Woo, that squared gives me way more bang for my buck. In fact, uh, I, I don't know about hockey, but I know in tennis and in golf, they'll always talk about racket speed, and in golf, it's all about club head speed. <clears throat> Why does Tiger Woods hit the ball so far? He generates tremendous club head speed, and that's how you can calculate how far someone's going to hit it. Okay, Ben, can you read to me this title? <laughs> Thunder and lightning should go off right now. There should be a distant rumble on the horizon. There should be a chill in your soul. You should get a feeling of shivering down your spine. This is one of the fundamental laws of the universe, the law of conservation of energy. It says this, <clears throat> energy is neither created nor destroyed. 
it can only be transformed from one type to another. And this means that if we're looking at a closed system, a situation that has no outside sources of energy, you're not plugging something into a wall, you're not getting energy from something else, the amount of energy before and the amount of energy after has to be the same. And if it's not, energy had to come from somewhere.